This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. It is a noon hour on Thursday, folks. Ted Rolson here in the Think Tech studios. Uh, looks like we're in Waimanalo today. At, uh, at, at probably at uh, probably at Makapu, as a matter of fact. Anyway, uh, online with us we have from uh, far away across the sea in Virginia is uh, Charles Warner. Charles, welcome aboard again. There you are. Thanks, glad to be here. Hey, great, great having you on again, uh, Charles. Uh, very appropriate in this particular episode of our show where uh, the series of uh, Where the Drone Leads is ending and uh, why not end on a high note with uh, the very, very important subject of UAS in public safety. And that's what Charles represents at the top of that, uh, of that echelon in terms of, um, in, in Charles' case, in terms of uh, his role as president and uh, chairman of the uh, uh, National Council for Unmanned Air Systems and Public Safety. And uh, so, Charles, it's great to have you on after hours, of course. Thanks for giving us your time. And um, how's things going, first of all, with the, the council and, and uh, its evolving role in forming up the way we're going to use UAS in public safety? Well, I think that uh, I, I polled 21 of my closest colleagues that have been in this for a while, and my first question was, uh, has Unmanned aircraft systems met your expectations in public safety, and the answer has been overwhelmingly yes, almost unanimous. Uh, and the excitement as we move forward is looking toward this, uh, the ability to fly beyond visual on a site and over people. And, and excitingly enough, in Virginia, our very own Mid-Atlantic Aviation Partnership, which is one of the six FAA test sites, was able to achieve the first beyond visual on a site over people waiver from the FAA following Hurricane Florence for Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. And so that's just showing kind of the, the change in the mindset uh, as we work with the FAA and, and them supporting us in our missions. That's fantastic. That's a great, uh, uh, great example. In fact, I opened my book here because I want to write down the, the, the thoughts of brilliance that come out here and take advantage of them. Um, but you mentioned FAA, and one thing that's most interesting, I think, to me and to a lot of people is the FAA's uh, reaction and response and promotion of the act, the items, the will of Congress items that are in the recent, uh, recently effected law called the FAA Re Reauthorization Act. There must be yes. a dozen elements in there that are really going to be pushing the utility of UAS forward in ways that we could never have imagined uh, occurring this early in our collective careers here. So uh, we have, I think, time clocks on most of these things, for example, the use of UAS in, in public safety, wildfires is the initial point, uh, federal address or management perhaps of the issues associated with privacy. Uh, even the most intriguing one of all perhaps is how the states, counties, and tribal governments are going to view UAS operations in the 400-foot layer of airspace adjacent to the earth. Does that belong to the FAA anymore or is that, should that rightfully belong to some other means of uh, agency? And how are we going to control all that? So there's been many more. But this is the biggest load of work we've ever seen pushed on the FAA, I think, Charles. And all of it is good. And uh, I'd, like, I'd like your thoughts on that, too. How do, we, how do we get in there and influence that and help the FAA move forward in the right way? Well, I think the, the really exciting thing for public safety is public safety was put on as a high priority for the FAA to work with. And one of the, uh, the side things that, that I understand is going to happen is they're going to create an emergency service stakeholder group to work more directly with the FAA and give um, some ideas and help as we transition and understand the space and, and work towards understanding how we actually move these things forward. So it is a very exciting time. The FAA is very excited as well. Uh, Congress has kind of given them more latitude to be doing things as well as creating some expectations. So it's good for all of us in that respect. That's great. So I think uh... Uh, with that activity, I, I would guess that this emergency service stakeholders group will be the means by which information is collected, such as from the National Council and uh, other organizations as well, fire departments, police departments, and state governments and such. So that's going to be a major task, pulling all that information together and then condensing it, consolidating it, and making sense out of it, and pushing it forward to the FAA. Is that an action that the Inspector General is going to be taken, taken on? Uh, I, I believe that uh, the stakeholder group and those kind of things will be done by the FAA itself uh, by a certain individuals. I mean, there are certain things that are mandated 
that the inspector general do, but he may also work through representatives that are already dealing with public safety, which which would make the most sense. That's great. And uh, again, I think that the right approach would be rather than wait till the FAA comes knocking on the door, would be to have our agencies, our governments and such, government organizations, have thought that through from their own, their own local perspective, like here in Hawaii, and have a, have a, a good set of ideas to bring forth rather than ask, get asked a question and then try to figure out what the answer is to the question. So um, actually we're having an event out here in Hawaii at the, at the state capitol on the 24th of January called Drone Day for lack of anything else, and this very issue will be one of the topics to be discussed with our legislature. Hey, Ledge, you have an opportunity to influence the future. Let's start thinking about it now. Well, well Ted, one of the things you and I have talked about, uh, currently I'm, I'm now working with 23 states to create state councils, and we're hoping that we can work through you or someone else there in Hawaii to create that, that voice from Hawaii that can be sharing uh, successes. Uh, you all had some very interesting missions with the volcanic activity, and we want to capture that and share it because uh, that's what we're all about. And, uh, and also to be able to hear your concerns or have that voice be able to express the questions that you have that we can expedite a response to those questions. So we'll be looking as the National Council to, to be working with you or whomever is so chosen to help develop that state council, which will then actually blend into a nationwide directory so we can really start sharing things across the board with best practices, lessons learned, trends, uh, or even dis start discussing training and how we go about doing training in regional areas to make make it uh, available. I appreciate your uh, invitation for us to participate in that. I did uh, circulate that message through our public safety people here and they all came back and said, why don't you do it? And I, normally I would jump into this thing and say, let's absolutely I'd be glad to do it, but I don't want to uh, to jump in front of somebody who might be more qualified. So I will uh, run that loop one more time and we'll see if we can't get you somebody and maybe the two of us together can operate in some way to be your agent from Hawaii on the council. Yeah, so let me let me just make sure I simplify this enough. So basically what we're trying to do is create a directory. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, it's not really about the person who has the expertise. It's basically being a connector and, and getting the information into a spreadsheet, and then the rest will kind of take care of itself. So I don't want to don't overcomplicate it, and whoever is the right person, I'll be glad to work with. Okay, well, that, that way you've defined it. Uh, sign me up. I will be your man, and we have the connections, I think, through the university, and uh, it's working out pretty well right now, so I'll be glad, glad to take, take that on. And uh, the way you All right, well, it. I'll send you the template that'll kind of walk you through the process that I used in Virginia, and uh, we'll work from it from there. That's great. Okay. And then, uh, once again, that, that kind of a mechanism allows us to uh, collect our ideas, collect our thoughts, and bring them into the picture for understanding at the federal level, and, and perhaps as an example of a way to do it. But you mentioned the volcano, and, and we've had other events out here of uh, not quite of that magnitude, but, but similar. Uh, believe it or not, sometimes the, uh, the hurricanes have generated a really interesting consequence called wildfire. How can you imagine a hurricane with all the rain coming down and a wildfire to coexist? Uh, they have. <laughs> but the, I, I think the second part of this that we have to think about, especially in regard to the volcano, is the, getting the, the incident command people, incident commanders themselves, emergency managers, getting that whole uh, aspect of the infrastructure and the, the social network that operates safety mechanisms, we have to get them into the picture uh, from the perspective of understanding what UAS are all about, how to capitalize on them, how to make it their solution. And when we start introducing beyond line of sight, that changes the scope and scale quite a bit. And uh, as you know from the experience that you were part of uh, as we were trying to get uh, some participation in on the, on the volcanoes, um, we had a situation where the, uh, the air boss is handling about 50 manned aircraft flights a day, which pr pretty much means in the daylight hours, which could be press, it could be helicopters, could be state officials, could be federal officials, uh, could be the tourist mm -hmm. helicopters. There's a, quite a range of things barraging the, the air boss for attention. So air boss is going to pay attention to those things. Unless we have some means of finding a way that UAS or designing a way that UAS can enter that mix, without adding to any stress on the part of the air boss, uh, we will we'll have a, a kind of a barrier there until we can solve that problem. So the unmanned traffic management system that NASA and the FAA have been developing might be a way in on that. But whether, whatever the technical solution is to getting in there, we do have the educational and, and socialization role. So 
to play to get the incident command structure uh, to adopt and accept. And I say that to you in, in particular because you are one of them. You are an incident commander uh, in the past and maybe even in the present. So how do we think of taking on that task of the socialization side of the equation uh, in parallel to the emerging technology? It's interesting you bring that up because it really is a cultural change uh, in how we do things. In, in a lot of cases, it, probably in most places in the country, the only air operations they would ever deal with would be a medical helicopter that's coming in or in a wildfire situation, uh, dropping water or some type of chemical to, as a suppress, suppression agent. Um, and now we have the opportunity to have drones flying in almost any significant event. And we could also have multiple agencies that arrive from a local and a state and a federal perspective that could all have drones. And, and the question is, when we have that and now we add in news drones on top of it, we, we start having how do we manage the space? And I know, we're, I know that uh, we had discussions and NASA Ames is working diligently on creating an unmanned traffic management system. But one of the other people at NASA all said it's important for us to understand is that it's not just unmanned traffic management, it's really all about air, tra air traffic management because it is the combination of both manned and unmanned and we've got to respect that. And, but there are ways, and I know that in California, the wildfires have, have kind of ch changed a little bit of the mindset because before there was no drones flying when we we're doing firefighting. Well, that's changed. Uh, they just had 16 teams that are flying 7,500 acres. What they've come to understand is, one, uh, the ability to communicate with the air boss, and the second is to create some general rules that say, if you're going to fly unmanned traffic management for certain purposes of damage assessment or situational awareness, that you may not exceed 100 feet in altitude. And what that does is it starts, it starts organizing the airspace in such a way that you can actually avoid most of your, your issues uh, with the exception of uh, helicopters and those types of things landing unexpectedly in places that they might not normally land. So there, there are ways to manage what we're, you're doing. I want to zip back a little bit to your reference to um, the air wing idea. And, and you're right, it's, it's, uh, it, it kind of depends on the department. Some departments air wings have embraced this wholeheartedly and they move in and realize the benefit. Others are resistant because they, they fear it somehow takes away from their current helicopter status or other things. And, and one thing that's really important to, to impress upon people is that uh, neither one replaces the other. They both have very unique and limited uh, capabilities in each of their respects. A helicopter can fly larger distances and cover more area and, and do a lot more things from a higher level, while drones are at a lower level and have a limited uh, flight process that they can go through or distance. And, and it, the, the, the drones can also get below tree canopies and see things that helicopters can't. So there's, it's really understanding that benefit and how it makes it work. The air wing is a natural fit if you have people that are proponents as opposed to opponents. And that's kind of one of the things you gotta look at. But we do have to be thinking more as we use drones of having an air boss, so to speak, or, or at least someone who's in charge of the air operations at an event so that you are coordinating and deconflicting the airspace. Absolutely, and uh, so Collectively, we have a social obligation to figure out how to do an educational campaign that addresses these issues and brings them up. And I think that should be part of our response into the FAA. Uh, the, um, the Emergency Services Stakeholders Group needs to think about that and maybe take it on. Let me bring an example up of what we're doing here on the North Shore of the surfing competitions and such, because it might be very similar to what's taking place in California after we get, get back from our one minute break. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host on ThinkTech Hawaii of Pacific Partnerships in Education. Every other Tuesday afternoon at 3 p.m., I hope you'll join us as we explore the value, the accomplishments, and the challenges of education here in the Pacific Islands. Yep. It is still Thursday noon hour, folks. Ted Ralston here in Honolulu. We have Charles Warner standing by once again, uh, coming on our show from Virginia. 
uh, Charles, who is the National Council uh, for UAS in, or Drones in Public Safety, the chairman and president of that organization. We're just talking uh, during the break about how uh, that conduit into the FAA to help them move forward in an effective way for drones and public safety is going to be a very important role here. But Charles was describing before the break about a social change taking place in the way UAS drones are used in California wildfire situations, at least some of them, but there's now a more cooperative spirit taking place and a higher level of utility then of the, un of the unmanned systems and even the manned systems as a consequence of that. So I was just asking Charles at the break, how, how is it that that actually started? How did that cooperative attitude form and get going? Well, I think it started by the, uh, those people that were remote pilots and had the unmanned aircraft systems and drones actually working with the air bosses and showing what could be done. And then they kind of came to an agreement to say, okay, if you, as long as you stay at 100, uh, 100 feet of, uh, of AGL above ground from an altitude standpoint, that they would be able to operate in and around the area without any any issues. I think, again, the, the major issue that started in the beginning was the interference that we had from hobbyist drones, and that kind of created a negativity that stayed for quite a while. But now uh, we, we've seen during these fires, I just had a report back, and I think I shared it with you, that there are 16 teams that are flying 7,500 acres, and they're getting a great deal of information. And one of the things that came out of one of the experiences is that when they were returning, from a UAS flight, they actually detected a fire that had started from a brand uh, that flew over in a different area that they didn't even know about. So they actually discovered the fire more quickly because of that drone activity. So now there is this coordination. And, and I'll just add to it, when you look back at Hurricane Harvey, we literally had thousands of flights combined, manned and unmanned, and we had very little issues because what the understanding is to those flying officially is that if there's a manned aircraft in the area, you will immediately go below the tree canopy or you will ground yourself and they have priority. And that's the understanding that needs to be in place. That's great. Are the hobbyists now part of that solution as opposed to part of the problem? Are they paying attention to these, uh, uh, these self-generated rules and obeying them? Uh, you know, that's still kind of a hit or miss type situation. In a lot of cases, it's better now because the word's getting out to the, the hobbyists through the news and other places. But you still have people that buy new drones today and they go out and start flying and they haven't heard or haven't had a reason to listen to any of that kind of stuff before. The other issue that's happened now is that under the new reauthorization act that uh, remote ID is now required. So we'll start seeing systems that can give us passive uh, identification and detection of both the controller and the aircraft. And in most cases, most state laws have a, have a law that says you can't interfere with incident operations. While you cannot uh, while you cannot manage the airspace, you can actually handle someone who is flying erratically or interfering with your incident operations through those kind of laws. But you'll have to be able to find out where they are. And that's some of the new technology that we'll be looking at next because there's going to be a balance between enabling uh, public safety drones as well as being able to identify friend from foe and potentially uh, nefarious actors. That's most interesting. Uh, there's so many different branches could come out of that last part of the conversation, but I'm intrigued by what has occurred in the California fire. So I'll connect with my California fire uh, friends and we'll see if we can't in adopt some of that attitude and thinking here. But there is something interesting that we can pass back to them. I just came across this yesterday talking to our ocean safety people, something I did not know was going on. We had the same kind of problem in the surf contests that take place on the North Shore here between November and February. Uh, because all the, uh, well, there's commercial drones out there uh, videotaping or, or, or taking uh, imagery of the competition itself. And uh, there may be even yeah. official interest on the part of the organizers of something they're going to collect. And then there's the hobbyists out there flying their drones uh, to do what they can in the, in the surf zone as well. What has apparently occurred is they've all gotten together and they said, we will be the eyes and the lookouts to assist the lifeguards in taking on actions that are needed. So the rules of the road, the unwritten rules of the road are that the drones are out there flying, hobbyist or commercial. And if you see somebody in distress, a guy who can't get back, get, get back on his board or a guy underwater, something like that, the drones go to that location and then do a flutter mode and sit there and, and, and wobble and attract attention. And that's a signal that says something underneath here is something you've got to pay attention to. And we, uh, we may have lost your signal here for a moment. I hope uh, that isn't the case. But um, I think the... The socialization and the 
collaborative feeling that has generated that North Shore action in, con in conjunction with what California has experienced on the wildfires would be a great, a great example of how this can actually work in a positive way. And the hobbyists aren't to be left out. They will, they'll come into the picture positively if we give them the guidance. I think that that's, a, that's an important point. I think we have to realize that there's a certain amount of um, allowance that's out there that, that different people have the, the ability to fly, I mean, and officially can fly. So you can't just say nobody can fly because you don't like it. So the best way to, to look at that is how do we educate all the people that are going to be involved and create a plan that says uh, if we're going to have commercial pilots, let's find out who they are and let's find out where they're going to fly and let's figure out how we organize this in such a way that everybody can benefit from their presence as opposed to uh, a con kind of confliction because we're not willing to work with each other. So what you're saying is we have a kind of an easy up attitude so that people who may not be instructed or informed or advised can still join this, this kind of a collaborative and slowly but surely they become part of the operating team and they begin obeying the rules and everything is going to go off in the right direction. But we get two examples, that's great. That actually leads to another category of discussion that I would like to get your thoughts on. That is the will of the Congress instructing the FAA to figure out how to manage the airspace below 400 feet. Does that still belong to the FAA like they have today from the blade of grass to the moon? Or is, is, is there some reality in terms of local government agencies managing their own airspace from 400 or, or pick a number uh, on down. Uh, to me, that, that is such a, uh, the question is, it has so many elements to it. I'm, I'm, you get different government organizations getting together, you got landowners involved, you got antennas poking up on top of buildings, there's technical issues, there's administrative issues, there's communication issues. What are your thoughts on that, Charles? How are we gonna address that in an effective way? Well, I'm hoping that a lot of feedback will be taken uh, from various users, commercial and public safety, of, in this, from this aspect. Because what we've got to be really careful about is we don't want to create a patchwork of different types of ordinances and regulations across the country. Because what happens, uh, I know in, in public safety alone, we have found out as we travel from state to state, because the regulations change somewhat of being able to fly, like they, they might have a stipulation in a state that says you can't fly an unmanned aircraft system unless you have a permit. And they, they, they were, just didn't think through the process of saying, well, except in an emergency for public safety to fly. So you don't want to have to be figuring out when you go from county to county what, what level can you be flying at, especially from a per public safety perspective. But then on the business side, if you're going to be looking at the, uh, the Amazons and the Googles of the world that are looking to do package deliveries, which could be very beneficial as well, having that hodgepodge or patchwork of, of different types of ordinances really creates confusion and would hinder the continuing evolution uh, in a positive direction for drones. That's a really compelling argument. And in fact, that fits with the discussions we're gonna be having here on the 24th of January at our, at our legislature. And that is, let's, let's try to discipline ourselves to stay away from making local specific rules right now. Let's let the next FAA Reauthorization Act uh, requirements work their way out find out what kind of leadership we're going to get out of the federal government and the FAA for dealing with these various issues. And once that's all in place, which will be a couple of years, I presume, because it, the lawmaking process is not fast, uh, then it would be evident what local rules might be necessary to supplement what's already in the federal uh, domain. But let's, let, let's not generate that hodgepodge, that uh, crazy quilt. Let's let the federal government do what it needs to do first and then we'll fill in any gaps that are necessary at the, at the state and local level. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that's important is that we, we need to continue doing outreach to our communities about the positive nature of what drones bring to our everyday lives to save, to save lives and property. Because at the end of the day, the public safety U.S. drones that are out there uh, really make a difference in making us being able to operate more effectively because we can see what we couldn't see. Uh, and it helps us operate more safely for the responders and the citizens alike. So there's a huge benefit of drones for public safety. Uh, one last question, Charles, and, and then the clock will run out on us here on, on this particular episode as well as this string of shows. But uh, uh, regarding the uh, standards work coming out of the, uh, uh, the various standard organizations, uh, 
There's uh, there's a uh, RTCL RTCA on the on the communication side. There's uh, ASTM on the technical and performance side, and there's uh, ANSI on the general overall process side. How do you see influencing those process those standard generating functions from the perspective of the National Council for UAS and Public Safety? Well, I think that comes back to to the discussion of creating the state councils. Uh, the state councils mm -hmm. allow us to have a communication capability to share. Uh, ideas and thoughts back and forth between each other, which we don't currently have. So, I mean, there is work being done, and there are those people that are in public safety that are engaged in the standards process, but it's still uh, very limited in who it is, and, and not only just adjusting it, but knowing what standards are out there and available for access. Uh, ASTM is one. The, uh, associate, the Airborne Public Safety Association has a set of standards that says if you're going to um, – have a drone program, here's the elements that you need to include in a program so that you realize it's not just buy and fly. You've got to have governance, policies, and procedures. You've got to have your maintenance uh, for the airworthiness, airworthiness of the aircraft and, and a lot more. And NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association, is supposed to come out really soon with NFPA 2400, which is a similar type of standard to the association, the uh, Airborne Public Safety Association. So ANSI, what ANSI's done is they've created the UAS a collaborative coalition or committee, if you will, that will look at all the standards and is creating the roadmap now of those standards that don't exist that should be addressed. Okay, so that's great. So ANSI is putting the, the big picture on, looking at the whole thing from top down and where there's gaps, they're going to identify those gaps and then the various technical organizations will jump in and st do something about that. It's great that NFPA yes. is putting its, uh, its out there. I know that uh, myself and, and Dr. Mike Brown and, and company were out there with those guys about three years ago and actually suggested that to them, that, hey, well, before this gets uh, set in concrete, why don't you, NFPA, generate a, a set of standards that apply to firefighters or that would benefit firefighters so that it's done from the users? Well, what they did, though, is they, the NFPA actually created the first multidiscipline uh, technical committee in their history, and I was actually the first chair of that committee. Okay. And you're chair now of the, uh, the larger issue, the, the National Council for uh, uh, UAS Use and Public Safety. Uh, what are the various other organizations besides NFPA that feed into the council, Charles? Since I'm now your Hawaii guy on the council, I need to start asking these questions. Well, there's, um, there's, there's about 30 national organizations, but I'll just give you kind of the highlights. The International Fire Chiefs, International Police Chiefs, National Sheriff's Association, uh, the major city uh, police chiefs, the major, uh, the Metropolitan Fire Chiefs Association, the, the uh, International Association of Emergency Managers, the National Association of Search and Rescue, um, so you get the picture. It's it's a large group of people that are that are communicating back and forth and sharing ideas across disciplines, not just being. We're trying to get away from those silos of excellence. Oh, great! And I hope the FA understands all that and takes pays attention to it and then turns to that as part of its emergency services stakeholder council, and maybe other councils that are out there as well as it as we go forward here with this amazing next five years of logic and, and regulations coming from logic that should be much more aligned to serve the future rather than what we've been in the past. So um, I'm looking well, forward. I will tell you that to date, I have to tell you that the FAA has been phenomenal working with public safety, helping to address the issues and get us in the air quickly and safely. And, uh, and I know they're anxious to help us move into the next levels of beyond visual line of sight. I think we all owe a, a, a big hand to them, and Jim Williams in particular, who kind of initiated this basic thought process in the FAA about five years ago. But just remember in our own past, and just in the last couple of years, people are still whining to the FAA. When are you going to get moving? When are you going to make regulations? When are you going to make this thing work? Now, they're moving so fast. The FAA, stop, stop. You're moving too fast. We can't remember when, when you made the last law change. So uh, we have a, a really uh, quite a change in sea state here in terms of moving forward with drones. So at this point in time, uh, I'd like to thank Charles Warner for being on about the fourth or fifth time you've been on the show, Charles, and appreciate your insight very much. Actually helps us tremendously to have this kind of concentrated insight which we can then generate in YouTubes and pass around and I'll be your man on the from Hawaii on the council and at this point in time we will uh, shut the show down and uh, we'll end this particular series of shows on drones thanks very much folks for watching